بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم I am Zafar Bangash welcome to Muslim Perspectives Today we are going to look at three trouble spots in the Muslim world The first is Palestine or more precisely Gaza under Zionist occupation and siege as well as the Egyptian siege Secondly the US war in Afghanistan and third the spill over of this war into Pakistan We'll first look at Gaza but before we do so I'd like to share this verse from the noble Quran the revealed word of Allah to guide mankind to the right path that refers to our responsibilities to help people in need In Surah Al-Baqarah Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala says A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Laysa al-birra an tawallu wujuhakum qibla al-mashriq wal-maghrib walakin al-birra man amana billahi wal-yawm al-akhir wal-malaa'ikati wal-kitaabi wan-nabiyyin wa ata al-maala 'ala hubbihi dhawi al-qurba wal-yatama wal-masakin wa ibn as-sabil was-sa'ilina wa fi-riqab wa aqama as-salata wa ata az-zakat and of course right to the end of this beautiful verse what it means is allah is saying that righteousness is not that you face towards the east or the west referring to of course our times of prayers but true righteousness is that you make your firm commitment to allah and that you believe in the day of judgment or the day of reckoning you believe in the angels the books that allah has revealed and all the prophets that allah sent to mankind to guide them and then it goes on to something very interesting and allah says that the wealth that you love you should spend on those of your relatives who are poor who are close to you on the orphans on the needy on those who are in bondage and debt those who are beggars and so on so we one can immediately see that even before this ayat goes on to explain our obligations to perform our daily salat the five daily prayers or even to give our zakat allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing help to needy and poor people now this is precisely what george galloway was doing when he led a 200 vehicle convoy that started from london england on december the 5th this was the third convoy that george galloway was leading to gaza to provide some relief in food and medicines to the besieged people now george gallo is not even a muslim and yet he feels obligated to help these desperately poor people in that desperate corner of the world yet george gallo we faced serious problems along the route along the way particularly at the hands of the egyptian government and the egyptian police many of his volunteers were attacked and brutally beaten in al arish the egyptian port from where the convoy was supposed to enter gaza which it ultimately did but we are going to show you some clips today that will give you an indication of how the egyptian security forces the egyptian regime and and the egyptian operatives behaved it is not a commentary on the egyptian people who are very noble people it is in fact a sad commentary on the pathetic state of the egyptian regime that is that has been in power in egypt for nearly 3 decades now we are going to show you some clips but let us start right at the beginning the convoy set off on its long journey from the heart of britain's capital but it's not aid from the british government that it's carrying on board the assortment of vans buses and ambulances are tons of aid donated by muslim groups and anti-war organizations from all over britain at the wheel of this bus is abdul latif from london who raised money from his local community to buy the vehicle and pack it with blankets food and clothing together with the community on the cultural central mosque in north kensington we managed to to get people to donate and they were tremendous before they set off they gathered in hyde park 110 vehicles all together These three women raised money from their local school. The van will be left in Gaza so that it can be used there. 
help. I just felt that the governments who should be helping are not doing enough. And once I heard about the convoy, I had a friend that I was actually going to sell. And I thought, no, I, I'm, I'm OK at driving, and why can't I take it? People are in need of love, support, care, you know, they feel alone. So I'm sure that just our entrance to them, you know, they will feel that they're not alone. And, like, we're family, we're all together. The convoy includes ten ambulances packed with medical supplies. There's even a boat making the journey, donated by someone who heard that Gaza's fishermen had their boats sunk in the conflict. One member of the British Parliament who's travelling part of the way said the convoy was designed to do more than just provide practical help. It's also symbolic um, because Palestine is completely besieged. In any normal situation, the whole world would be airlifting aid to Gaza. The convoy will pass through France, Spain, then along North Africa and through Egypt. They hope to pick up supporters on the way, and if all goes according to plan, they'll be in Gaza 20 days from now. A large crowd of family and friends gathered to cheer them on their way. This is a movement of the streets, as Mr. Ben said. This is a movement of the streets of Britain, north, south, east and west. This is not top down. This is not a convoy of big personalities and celebrities. This represents the bedrock of the British working class communities of England, Scotland, yeah. Ireland and Wales. And I think that we are the best of British. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Brown and Mr. Blair boast that they are Israel's best friends. Well, we are Palestine's best friends. Yeah. We will travel to Rafa and we will go through the gates of Rafa. Yeah. But there are many governments responsible for this great crime in Palestine. But the dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak is jointly responsible for the murder of every Palestinian who has died these last two years when he was embracing Livni as the bombs were falling when he locked the border at Rafa he became an international criminal and an outlaw of the Arab world to see you here. You're welcome. This is not a religious uh, between Muslim and uh, Jews. It's uh, against humanitarian. You know that? This is, this is the basic human rights for every human being. What God gave to every creature to live in peace, his home, his family, the right to live. And these people are taking away the right of people to live. This is something which is... What is Israel no mean to you? Israel means the very... It is complete. It, it means nothing, nothing Jewish in any aspect. Since his establishment has not been Jewish from the start, it's against. It's a transformation from Judaism to a nationalistic, political, colonial entity. Uh, we are at the Rafah border crossing. Uh, about um, 50 to 70 uh, trucks uh, already crossed into Gaza. Uh, uh, the first delegation that has crossed into Gaza was the Turkish delegation. Um, the rest is uh, coming very soon from uh, the crossing behind me. I, th I think they, they, they are coming. Yeah, they are holding now. Right That's now, George, they are Galloway, holding George Galloway on the shoulders. If you can see him now, he's now uh, he's coming now towards us. Uh, George Galloway, uh, British MP George Galloway, the leader of Respect Party. He is the leader of uh, this aid convoy. This is the third Viva Palestina aid convoy that has successfully made it into Gaza despite the hardships, despite the suffering. They spent many days stranded in the Jordanian port of Al-Aqaba and also in Al-Arish. They crossed many countries and they were, they were hoping that they wouldn't face any obstacles. 
Uh, I heard uh, George uh, earlier say that he's planning to send even more convoys. We are trying to speak to some of the members of the convoy. I suppose, Yusuf, uh, uh, it's worthy to ask you this if George Gallup and uh, just Okay, now I think, Kavi, are you with me? I have a guest here. Go ahead, Yusuf. Kavi, are you with me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Right, go ahead. okay, finally you have made it into Gaza. How do you feel right now? Oh, I feel ecstatic. It's been a long time and a long journey. And sometimes, the last few days, we never thought we'd make it. But we're glad we're here now. We're the people of Gaza have made us feel absolutely welcome, so we're delighted. Okay, of course, uh, despite the hardships that you face, you are so happy. Now, tell us, how, uh, how was the um, treatment of the Egyptian authorities? The Egyptian authorities give us a hard time at the port. But uh, we expected that. When we got everything we expected. But all in all, the trip was very good. It was very hard at times. But George Galloway was in no mood to mince his words upon his arrival at Heathrow Airport from Cairo. He said he was manhandled by Egyptian intelligence officers before being deported and told never to come back. Uh, I'm sorry to say that Egypt is deeply implicated in this uh, siege. That's the reason for the revenge on me. Uh, and I hope not on the rest of the convoy. I hope they'll stop at me. Uh, they hate these convoys because they expose the existence of a siege that Egypt denies. For the past month, Galloway has led the Viva Palestina humanitarian aid convoy, which has traveled all the way from London to Gaza to deliver aid to its besieged people. But the Egyptian authorities, who together with Israel are enforcing a strict economic blockade on the Palestinian people, did not welcome the convoy's arrival and even assaulted some of its members. Egyptian police also beat another group of Gaza peace activists in Cairo, hitting women and injuring many. These activists were forced to admit defeat and headed back home. I think Britain's relationship with this uh, dictatorship uh, should be reviewed because all dictatorships fall and their dungeons are cleared and their uh, victims uh, are released and then the dictators run away with what they can steal and their torturers hang from the highest trees. The Viva Palestina convoy and its 200 or so vehicles eventually arrived in Gaza to a hero's welcome a few days ago and handed over medical aid to the Hamas government. However, there's concern that hundreds of convoy members who are yet to leave the area will be mistreated as well. But despite his anger, Galloway said he wouldn't heed mounting calls for a boycott on Egypt. I know that the regime, as I say, gorges itself on the billions of US dollars that it's given, leaving their people hungry. Uh, and they will not be affected by that kind of boycott. The only people who will be affected are the poor Egyptians. The Egyptian authorities have called the Viva Palestina convoy members hooligans who provoke violence with the Egyptian police. From Gaza, let us move on to Afghanistan, a country that has not known anything but war for the last 30 years. First it was the Soviets, then the Americans that invaded Afghanistan in October of 2001. And since the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in October of 2001, tens of thousands of Afghans have been killed. How many? We do not know because this is one statistic that the Americans or the West are not interested in. After all, Afghan lives do not matter. It is only American, British, or Canadian lives that are of interest and significance to people in the West. There are not many other statistics about Afghanistan available either because it is one of the poorest countries in the world. Yet there is one statistic that we do know, and that is that more than 60% of Afghanistan's population lives or is below the age of 25. There is widespread poverty in the country. According to the United Nations, Afghanistan is the third poorest country in the world. Amid all this poverty, children and women have suffered the worst. In fact, women are the ones ostensibly for whose liberation the Americans invaded Afghanistan in the first place. But let us stick with the plight of children. We are going to show you some clips that indicate and reflect the plight of children in Afghanistan. It's not a life you would want for any child. 
These young boys work day in, day out, recycling plastic at a factory here in the southern city of Kandahar. They're issued with sharp knives and given the job of removing the labels from water bottles, which are then recycled for profit. Most of the bottles come from the nearby NATO air base, the largest in Afghanistan. NATO has a deal with the factory, which takes all of its waste plastic. I first came across the boy laborers in the middle of the harsh Afghan winter. This is Ali Mohammed, 12 years old. His job is to collect plastic waste from rubbish bins in the city center. We then met up again at a medical clinic set up by the Canadian military. Sitting with his eight-year-old brother, he told me about their daily routine. I come in the morning at 7 or 8. I work until sunset and go to bed and do the same the next day. Like the other children, he tells me he earns less than a dollar a day, which he gives to his family who are homeless and live in a tent. In the freezing cold of winter, and now the summer heat, they go off to work on the streets. Here, some of the children are taking a break in these sweltering conditions. No one here is hiding the fact there are children workers in this factory, but nothing is totally black and white in this war-ravaged country. Listen to the justification of the factory's owner. People watching this will say that you are exploiting children. What's your answer to that? In the present situation, I think what I have been doing is very good because the future of these children is not clear. They can't be educated because they have to find food to cover the expenses of their family members. If they don't work for me, they will do illegal actions and do bad things. So, child exploitation or an important social service. One thing is not in doubt, this is an extremely tough life, a life they didn't choose. It's a treacherous journey, but that doesn't stop these Afghan boys from making it every day. Hundreds of them smuggle flour from Pakistan using illegal routes in the mountains of eastern Afghanistan. Many have been injured after falling from high ground. Some have died while walking along these mountain trails, most recently a 16-year-old. Doctors warn that these children also face the risk of getting run over by trucks near the border. At times, these boys walk for hours. Almost all of them are underage. They say they have no other choice because they need to help their families survive. I don't want to go to school because if I do, I cannot earn money. My father told me to bring the flour across the border. I walked for two hours with 14 kilos of flour on my back. Extreme poverty drives many children to work in Afghanistan. Here in the province of Jalalabad, activists say more than 500 of them are now involved in this illegal trade. These children are at times the only breadwinners in their families. That is why the dangers they face are ignored for the sake of earning a few dollars a day. Two countries divided by the Rurand borderline. A line drawn in the 1800s by the British to divide the Indian territory from Afghanistan. But for these people here, this line artificially divides the Pashtun population, who continue to move across the border, forgetting that the separation between the two countries actually exists. I believe that this border shouldn't be here, says this man, because on both sides there are Afghans leaving. We're all brothers. It's a tense time here. Taliban, the radical Islamic group that used to rule this country, are mostly Pashtuns. And international forces here believe that insurgents are crossing from Pakistan into Afghanistan, where attacks have spiked in recent weeks. They hide among the hundreds of families that make the trip daily. Nowadays, the only reminder of the political divisions between both countries is this gate, where border guards search incessantly for explosives and weapons. This is the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. As you can see, people here can circulate freely, no visas, no passport required. That is why it is so difficult to control the Taliban movement. Rahmatullah says he will never forget the suicide bombing that shook this city last February, when a car full of explosives killed at least 38 Afghans. Now he's afraid to leave his home. Taliban brought security, he says. Now if you carry money, your life will be in danger. 
There were no explosions. Now suicide bombings are normal. Every day civilians are dying and in every house there is sadness. Suicide attacks have become a regular worry for everyone in the city. They have seen three in the last months. Southern Afghanistan continues to have a strong Taliban presence. In fact, many here support them. Of course there is Taliban here, says this man. All we want is our own Islamic government. The Taliban will bring that. Afghan authorities try to control the cars with Pakistani tax and continue to blame the Pakistani government for not doing enough to stop the Taliban from attacking their country. But most residents here prefer to remain silent and neutral. They know that there is an ongoing war between the government and the conservative radical group. A war that has left already too many innocent people dead. Beyond the people moving back and forth between Afghanistan and Pakistan is America's deliberate policy to extend the war from Afghanistan into Pakistan through drone attacks. The low-level American war in Pakistan has taken scores of lives, but has rarely put Americans in danger. It is conducted with remote-controlled drones shooting missiles, deadly aircraft piloted by men at times half a world away. The U.S. military says it is targeting al-Qaeda men and Taliban who fight in Afghanistan and then take refuge across the border in Pakistan. The New York Times reports that that strategy is undergoing a rethink, one that will expand the Americans' ability to engage in hot pursuit. Until now, the drones have hit targets in Pakistan's tribal areas. A new plan under study now, the newspaper says, involves extending their range from the tribal areas to the province of Baluchistan and the city of Quetta, where the U.S. believes its enemies are finding shelter. The American defense secretary reacted to the story by saying he was not going to get into details about a policy review nearing completion. But he admitted there was a problem. Well, I think, I think we all have a concern about the Quetta Shura and uh, the, the activities of the Taliban in that area. Uh, but I, I think this is principally a, a, a problem and a challenge for the Pakistanis to take on. And, and as we've indicated, um, we are prepared to do anything we can to, uh, to help them do that. There have been angry protests after every missile strike, six since Barack Obama took office. But some analysts say Pakistan doesn't mind the strikes as long as they stay in the tribal areas. I believe that they, they quietly approve of what's going on there. I don't think that they would go along with expanding that source of instability to yet another part of Pakistan. The strategy of missile strikes may be working militarily, but politically it is hurting the government of Pakistan. A spokesman in that country has said that reports of increased American military activity were only speculative, but that missile strikes were not productive. Quetta, the capital of Pakistan's Balochistan province, is where U.S. officials believe Taliban and al-Qaeda leaders are now hiding, and they are considering expanding their covert military war to the area. But provincial authorities denied the groups are based in the province and have warned the United States of dire consequences if the region is targeted. The warning coincided with CIA chief Leon Panetta's visit to Islamabad on Saturday to discuss a review of strategy to fight the Taliban and al-Qaeda. Pakistan officials have said the strategy so far hasn't worked and drone attacks have been counterproductive. Many believe Pakistan's security forces should take the lead. That action was to be taken by Pakistani forces. We asked for the technology, we asked for the uh, drones as well as the equipment. I think the U.S. did not uh, listen to that. <laughs> the drone attacks have had a domestic backlash. There is anger in Pakistan's lawless northwest. CIA-operated drones have been covertly targeting al-Qaeda and Taliban members, but more often than not, civilians are the unintended victims. Pakistan has always said it is a victim of terror. The Marriott Hotel in Islamabad, it now looks like a military base. You can see the security measures that have been put in place since the September suicide attack. Many here feel that Pakistan has been paying a heavy price for its alliance with the U.S. in the so-called war on terror.
Washington and its allies believe the new focus of its fight against the Taliban and al-Qaeda needs to be in Pakistan, specifically in the border areas. Pakistan says it is committed in this fight. It is under threat. But it differs with the U.S. in the approach. Pakistan believes it should take the lead. That may be the only way to deal with growing public anger over what is seen as a proxy war waged on behalf of the United States. Pakistan stands accused by its closest allies of failing to do enough in the so-called war on terror. But this nuclear nation is locked in a brutal war here in the tribal district of Bajor. In this two-part series, I've traveled through the tribal areas to witness the human cost and the reality on the ground for the Pakistani army. Virtually unnoticed, a humanitarian crisis of massive proportion. There is bombing, says this man. There is trouble. The roads are clogged with civilians seeking to escape. Tens of thousands fleeing their homes in the Bajor Agency of the Northwestern Frontier Province, the epicenter of a major offensive by the Pakistani military against the fighters of the self-styled Pakistan Taliban. An ongoing battle in which dozens of combatants on both sides have been killed and hundreds of civilians. We're running away from Bajor because of the bombing, says this child. There are always helicopters attacking overhead, says another, clinging to the back of the horse-drawn cart. The more fortunate in vehicles, crammed with family members and friends. And this is where most will end their journey. One of the more than 30 camps that have been established near Peshawar, well away from the war zone. What is referred to as the war on terror is in Pakistan not a global issue, but a domestic one. And this is a consequence. Hundreds of thousands of civilians caught between armed fighters and the military, driven from their homes. Officially, they are called internally displaced people, IDPs. But what they are, are refugees from a civil war. In the face of what is seen as a major challenge to national security, there's a forceful response. The military demonstrating its intent to end the insurgency by whatever means necessary. In the mountains, the fighters continue to resist fiercely. Local leaders like Mullah Omar match in evidence, here displaying his camouflaged armored command vehicle and relaying instructions to the fighters in the field. The army is keeping on its attacks, he says on the telephone. So let us teach them a lesson. But it's also the civilians who are being taught, the lesson being digested in the camps that in this fight they may be expendable. It's so hot here, I'm sweating. You are sweating, said Mahmoud Khan. Imagine how hot the children are getting. Come with me and I'll show you my tent, says Shajen. We follow. There is bombing at the home I love, he says, and now I've come to nothing but a wasteland. And, a, and nothing to sleep on but a threadbare blanket laid on the damp ground under canvas. That's all for today. You have been watching Muslim Perspectives, which is broadcast every Saturday, Toronto time at 10.30 a.m., on the following channels, Rogers Channel 129, Bell Express View Channel 217, and Star Choice Channel 348. We look forward to seeing you again next Saturday at the same time at the same channel. Until then, I'm Zafar Bangash. Thank you for watching Muslim Perspectives. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.